Hello, and welcome to the Cabin Boy Knits Woolcast, coming to you deep from the Canadian forest. This is Christopher. And this is the other guy. Jamie. We have a lot we want to share with you this episode. We finally launched our store, and we participated in a virtual trunk show and a maker's box. And in the maker's box, there's a Paulworth sheep, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what's in his dye pot, Valentine's Day. And what's in your kitchen? and a collaboration we want to share with you as well. And I'm going to take up my whip. And at the end of the episode, we're going to do a draw for the free patterns from Tannis Gray. So sit back, grab your favorite drink, and we'll tell you our story. So the big news is, for us anyway, is the launch of our new store. The online website. The online website. And we've been talking about it for a long time. A while. And we finally launched it on February 5th. Is that the same day as? The same day as our virtual trunk show. And yeah. so I want to talk a little bit about the website. Mm -hmm. um, and then the trunk show as well. Okay. So the website... There wasn't as much drama as I thought there would be around launching the website. There was a lot of stories start with drama. <laughs> well, there was a lot of work. There was a lot of work, and yes. I purposefully did do a lot of advertising beforehand because I wanted it up, and I wanted to make sure it was up. So, yes. so, and also we wanted to coincide with because we mentioned we wanted to coincide with the trunk show. Yes, because I was afraid that hmm, what if <laughs> once we have all this product ready to go. Yeah. What What if? You mean what if it doesn't work? Well, that's <laughs> see, that was part of the stress. So we had to have it up and running. So we, I, we quietly put it up the day before. And then it was, it was up. We didn't say anything about it. But it was we tested it. And it was working. And I think there was only one glitch that happened the day of. And we fixed yeah, that. that. So was minor. It was minor. So it was awesome. It was great. And I just want to thank all of you for so all the great feedback you've given us and all the support. It's really, I really, really appreciate it. And all the people that turned up at the virtual yes, trunk show. Yes, exactly. We were surprised about that. There like, are quite a number of people that joined us. That was fantastic to see faces. Yeah, we were 1 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Didn't think a lot of people would show up. And you showed up. And you not only showed up, you showed like up with your questions. But I feel like they were at work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're working, we're working from home, though. So Exactly. Guess, yeah. So that was, that was really wonderful. And it was, it was great to see familiar faces. I will say, though, it's a little challenging when you've got your um, screen, which is only so big, and you've got a lot of people on there, and trying yeah. to, to connect with people and um, talk about your yarn at the same time. Well, also they kept, you know, the, the people were kept signing, signing up, signing up. And, and we, uh, yeah. well, I was kind of following as quickly as could to, to admit them. Yeah, you did a good job. Ad for sure. To the site. And then following the, following the comments and questions as well. Yeah. Down the side, which. Time... Well, that's the problem too, because when the, when you've got a number of people on there and they're asking questions, um, they go up. Quite yeah, quickly, they you don't get blow. to see them. Yeah, and I was I was sort of scrolling back and forth, and I was sort of like my face is close to the to the camera because I was trying to lean in to read some of it and keep up with the. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. What I have learned from it is mm -hmm. that I'm going to buy a larger screen. That's <laughs> a good. I think that's a good point. Because I some of the names I couldn't read, and if it's a bigger screen, you can see people and it's they yeah, can get larger and, on it, and and the commentary as well, and the questions. More importantly, yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we learned how to use the mute button. 
<laughs> oh yeah, there's a conversation going on in the there background. Were many, there were a few conversations going on in the beginning. But you figured it out. Like, I was so impressed. I was sort of like, well, I was like, excuse me, um, <laughs> hi. And then I could see people were, I could see people. I think faces. you started speaking French. And I did because I, well, there was, there was, <laughs> there was, there were a couple of people speaking French. So I was like, excuse me, bonjour, pardon, pardon. <laughs> and, then, and then I could see, I was looking, I was trying to think, who's talking? But I could see everyone going like this. So they were giving the message as well. They were going, going. You know, they were already muted, but they were going, yeah. going, shush, 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 please. And eventually we we worked out all of the glitches and on it went. Yeah. And then that night we dialed into, dialed in, we logged into <laughs> a cocktail party and that was held by the, hosted by the Grocery Girls and Gigi. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And yes. I think that um, one of the Grocery Girls um, took the lead in it. And, and I think she did a great job of facilitating the... The cocktail party it was it was fun there were a lot of people oh my i mean gosh. we thought we had a few people or quite a few <laughs> numbers of people but compared to them it was few compared to they had like there was like well over 400 well over 400 yeah so but they managed it well and they asked there was a lot of interaction with questions which um was very good yeah so the bottom line is that the whole festival was fantastic it was a great experience for us and I'm sure others had a great experience as well. It was just the communication was terrific, and uh, we had a great time uh, in the trunk shop. Yeah. So. And you want to thank Knit City, Knit Social. For... Knit Social, Knit City, Virtual, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for for allowing us to participate. We had a lot of fun, and the story continues with the Maker's Box. Yes, and the Maker's Box was part of. It is part of Knit Social, which is the umbrella over Knit City Virtual yes. um, and other events. And um, this is something that I've been dying to tell you, talk to you about for the last two months. And I haven't mm. been, I wasn't allowed to talk about it because That's it was right. part of the Mystery Makers Box. Yes. But I want to get into this whole story about it because it was, it was, a, it was great. Yeah. Like, so two, two, about two months ago, they reached out and asked, they being Knit, um, Knit Social, and said, do you want to participate in a Makers Box? And we said, absolutely, we, we do. Sure. And so we said, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll um, have 50 skeins. We'll, we'll take the largest amount we can. And they said, great. Um, but the story didn't stop there. They basically said, okay, you're going to be participating in this maker box with other dyers and ma other makers. And we want you to be inspired by, and they gave us a, f a few photos to yes. look at. And I love that challenge because we had to look at the photos yeah. and then think about, you know, what does that mean to us and how can we tell that or tr portray that in yarn? That's right, because it's kind of like a storyboard, but in the photos they wanted sort of a, a color coordinated storyboard yes. yep. where all of the makers would sort of, there would be um, a tie in, what do you call that, like a, uh, what am I trying to say, like a common thread. Yeah, yeah, no, the, uh, they, they, they wanted definitely a common thread throughout yes. the maker's box. Yes. And I thought that was a fantastic idea. And so Kevin Boynitz had a meeting. So we met. Did we? Yes, and we talked Where was about. I? We were. You were there because we were saying, okay, let's look at these pictures and oh, what should yes. we do? How can we um, reflect the pictures um, with our yarn? And so we discussed, you know, what yarns, what what yarns, what dye, what, what yarn are we going to use, and what dyes are we going to use as well? So yes. let's get into the dyes first, and then we'll get into the yarn. How about that? Are we going to show them what we have? Or yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not a surprise. <laughs> it's a big surprise. No, I'll share. <laughs> We're going to tell them about it. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you about it. No, you can tell them about it and then show it. So oh, there it I is. did the exact opposite. I just <laughs> said. <laughs> okay, so I want to make sure that we got this right. Spruce. Yes. Yeah. So we were talking about how, what are we going to do and how are we going to reflect uh, the pictures into this yarn. And I'm really, really happy with this uh, and how this turned out. Yeah. So we decided on the sky's blue. There was sky in all of the pictures, pretty much. Yes. And so we wanted to reflect a cold um, winter. Yes. And so because they were all winter scenes. They were all winter scenes. They were winter yes. scenes. Yep. Yes. And so this is indigo. Indigo is the best choice for that. Yep. For the blue. And then we had spruce. I wanted to put white spruce in because yeah. um, it complement some of the colors that were in the pictures and so and the thought of the white spruce because white spruce you just think like when you see winter scenes and you see an evergreen with snow on it so no there's no green in it per se but we did use the white spruce for that reason but it does create the nice uh, the nice yellowish hues which looked like some of them had a bit of a 
uh, a sunset or a sunrise over the snow so you could see yeah. the reflection like golden reflection over the snow yep yeah. and then we used oak as well and so I thought yeah. that that was great so we had white spruce oak and indigo and then we left um, a little bit exposed so we that, so basically undyed because there was a lot of snow in in these pictures as well and we wanted to yes. show that reflect that in and that that's image. very different than how you would normally dye these variegated or multi multi colored um skeins because because you wanted the specific colors as far as the common thread of the color coordination um, you purposely wanted to make sure that you didn't overlap any of the colors because you didn't want a third and fourth or sixth color entering into that yeah. color scheme. So do you know so, why I just unspun it and then held it out? Why is that? Because we had we were asked on our oh, <laughs> on our trunk yes. show numerous times, especially with the multi dyed, to um, unwind it and show what it looks like. So that's what it, that's what it looks like. Yeah. And so this is what happens. So we finish dyeing and then we ship it off to um, Knit Social and they put it in a maker's box and our maker's box is called um, names. yeah there's names because there's three boxes oh and, I didn't know that yeah and ours oh. is winter something <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes <laughs> I had it in okay, my show I notes and I lost I did, it how am I the last to know these things I thought there was one box and we were a part of it and that's it no 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 no, no. There's so now three there's boxes. a name to the box there's a name to the box there's oh three gosh. boxes I will put it in the show notes but I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on the on the makers box as well because we are in very good company oh okay. so I will so basically you get a box and in the box like uh, someone purchased you purchase the box. you purchase a box yes okay and then inside the box there are a number of um, different things and in, in ours it's yarn various types of yarn oh. and the wonderful thing about it is at knit social they picked um they picked dyers that have very distinct voices so when you look at their yarn you can tell whose yarn it is and so and, and a perfect example of that is koigu koigu is, is oh, in yes. here oh, okay. and right. so we uh yeah Oh, definitely. And they've got great yarn, and you know a Koigu yarn um, when you pick it up. And then they have um, Songbirds is in there. Songbirds is from Ontario as well. Mm. And Songbirds, actually, every yarn that you buy of theirs, $2 of it goes to um, the Songbirds Conserv Conservatory. And do you get Conservation. A, and do you get a bird with, do you get a bird with <laughs> your yarn? You don't get a bird, you but you help like support a... A good cause. A good cause. Okay. Yep. I should never make fun of a good cause. You should never make fun of a good cause. And then we have Flock Fiber, and they're out of the West Coast. And Yarn mm -hmm. Therapist, who we're very familiar with, uh, they're from Ontario. And Colorist. <laughs> what does it come? Does that come with a pre therapy session? I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Why are you going to buy a case? <laughs> And then the colorista out of Quebec. Oh, and, I like that name. And then um, Jelaine. Jelaine. Jelaine out of Montreal. That almost sounds like a play on words because if you say it's all, if it wasn't an, it's, if it's an M or an N, it would be like, I love, but it's wool as opposed to Jelaine, Jelaine. So yeah. je, I think that must be a play on words there. Like similar to your name. Yes. <laughs> Have yes. you shared that story yet? No, I have not shared that story, so it's Jamie. But if you spell it the other way with J-A-I-M-E as opposed to J-A-M-I-N-E, it's Jem. And there was a girl who was smitten by me in high school. <laughs> and every day when she'd see me and we'd pass each other in the stairs or in the hallway, she'd go, Bonjour, Jem. Jem, <laughs> which is, I love. Jem. <laughs> and that's that was, Je, je Whatever happened to her, do you know? Yes, I, I, I remember her. Her name is, oh, should I say her name? No, that's Nicole. I won't say her last name. But then she went to work for the um, CBC radio. She was okay. very, very, her French was impeccable. And she was very, um, she said she was going to become, in high school, she said she would become the first female prime minister. And then she worked for the CBC. And I did run into her a few years after high school and um, she, she was interviewing for her, her CBC show and, and she was she was surprised that I was still had my French and that was just so oh. so proper. Is she a knitter or a crocheter? I have no idea. Oh, I've been her and that was oh my gosh, thirty years ago. So we, we got the 
I was two. We we basically decided on all of, all the color. We were really happy with the color. We shipped it off. But the other piece of this, I want the other piece of the story that I want to share mm -hmm. with the group is the fiber. We were just trying to figure out what fiber we wanted to use on this. And so I figured we've got we're in with a bunch of Canadians in this box. So we probably um, I imagine there's going to be a lot of Canadian wool. So I want something that would be unique to to the purchaser purchaser when they saw it. Mm -hmm. So we went outside of Canada. And we actually went all the way to New Zealand. And we have Polworth. And there okay. was a reason why I wanted to pick Polworth. One is because um, it was it, it had arrived just about this time. I'd, we'd ordered it earlier. And the Polworth, um, I know you're itching to talk about that. Well, and I think you should talk about like what's the fiber, like what yeah, yeah, yeah. the fiber yeah, so all the, about. So the reason I wanted to pick it was because it, uh, Jamie's going to talk a little bit about um, the history of where it came maybe. from, maybe, um, but also, oh, I don't have my drink with me. Jeez, absolutely. No, no. So <laughs> I picked it because it is close to a merino in some respects, but mm -hmm. it has a sheen that the, that merino doesn't have. And so as a dyer, I wanted to see how that would pick up color and how that would translate. Right. And, and so this is definitely... It's like a 75%. Did you shave today? Yes. I okay. Did. No, I just want to do the. Isn't that nice? The and soft touch. It's, it's really yes. soft. And that's because, as you know, it's seventy-five percent merino. Yeah. And twenty-five percent Lincoln longwood. Yeah. yeah. And it's super soft. And why is that? Because of the merino. Is there a count? <laughs> yeah, it's a fine wool. So I think the micron count on this is around twenty-one. Between 21 and 25? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, something like that. It's soft. It's soft. Yeah. It's, it's nice and soft. Is it over to you now? I could tell you a little bit more about its history. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. Yes. I Okay, so let's just start with... Okay, we'll start with Polworth, the name. Let's start there. Sure. So the Polworth was developed in the 1880s in Australia. In the district of Victoria, and most people know that when they read uh, they read about the Polworth, that's where pretty much the Polworth comes from. Yeah. Now that would have been Australia's very first first developed breed of sheep was the Polworth. But the history goes back a little further than that because we mentioned the merino. So the merino, I talked about merino in the past coming from Spain, but how it got to Spain is you know during um, Oh, I would say during medieval times, um, it was when the Arabs moved on over from the Arabian Peninsula into North Africa and eventually brought along their sheep, mm -hmm. which is like uh, where they figure the Merino originate, moved into North Africa. So by the, and this is like around the seventh century, then in the 12th and 13th century, they pretty much had spread across North Africa and places like Morocco, and from Morocco in 12th, 13th century over into Spain. And it's at this time in Spain where we know Merino always mentions how it originates in Spain. Now, the royals, the Spanish royals, um, they were so smitten by this incredible breed of sheep, and it's wonderful softness of the fiber that they wanted to keep that breed very pure and um and the stock just as it was from the get-go sure that makes and, sense and so they then you know they pretty much developed uh that amazing breed of merino over the years but now how did this breed part of this breed get to australia well i had mentioned how the rambouillet King Charles III of Spain had gifted um, the Merinos over to France and they became the Rambouillet. Well, in this case, he then gifted a flock of his famous prized sheep to his other cousin in Germany. Wow, it was pretty generous. In Germany in 1765. 1786 was over into France. So earlier than that, he had gifted this flock to Frederick Augustus III. Now this is a little confusing, but it was he was actually I believe. Where's he was, my whiteboard? He was actually well. This is where it, it, it took a lot of digging, but I was trying to. The names used many times. You know in royalty sure. how they yes. use the name many times. So yeah. Frederick Augustus the first, I believe, is 
from Germany, but then his title was Elector, the Elector of Saxon, Frederick, um, Frederick August Augustus the Third, the Elector of Saxon, who then eventually became the King of Saxony um, in eighteen in eighteen o six. So he was gifted these merinos in seventeen sixty five. Sure, and because he was from Saxony, they were called the Saxon Merino. Oh yes. So yep. what happened then in during the late teens, set of the late seventeen hundreds, the Napoleonic Wars happened, and um, large parts of Germany were occupied by the French, and so this Sa this prized Saxon Merino was starting to not do so well. Um, but they were also very highly prized and started to be, you know, they were s being sold and shipped off um, at high rates and for big dollars. Um, so then this brings us to about 1830, where this um, Scottish couple, the Furlongs, they decided that, wait a minute, there's an opportunity here, a business opportunity. So the wife, Elizabeth Furlong, she decided uh, that she went and made a specific tri trip to Prussia, yeah. to, in Sax Saxony uh, area, and she brought back a flock of sheep, or numerous sheep, over to Scotland. Once in Scotland, she bred the sheep, or the, her and her husband, they bred the sheep, but then they decided, okay, we need to improve this, we want to maintain this breed, and they thought it would be better that they relocate to Tasmania in Australia. So they brought their flock of sheep to a warmer climate where there was a better better feeding grounds, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, um, and the breed could improve and do very well there. So this brings the sheep into the 1830s in Australia, and that's where they were they were initially became the first of these sheep, the Saxon Merino. So now you have these brothers, three brothers, the Dennises. So the Dennises' three brothers is John, William, and Alexander. They immigrated to Australia in 1839 from Cornwall, England. So these brothers moved moved around a bit. They arrived in Melbourne, then they, then they went to Tasmania, and then they were in the district of Victoria, where they eventually bought 600 of these Saxon merinos and began breeding them. And eventually some of the other, some of the other uh, farms and, and, and land leases came up for sale and they they bought other flocks and land leases because it sort of all worked they they all sort of bred on crown land but yep. they purchased the leases and then they it came with the flock of sheep now by 18 1867 two of the brothers alexander and william bought one of these land leases with the flock of sheep and they were lincoln long wool can i just interrupt you for a second sure. okay so and you can take a I take a drink a <laughs> So that's really interesting because then the question is, how did the Lincoln Long Wool get over there? And so on an earlier episode, we were talking about Lincoln Long Wools and Robert Bakewell in, in England and how he was wanting to um, really develop the Lincoln Long Wool and, uh, through selective breeding. And so he had a huge influence on selective breeding around the world. And Char Charles Darwin even uh, references him as oh, well. Oh, is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. And so the Lincoln Long Wool became so famous... Uh, because what he was doing, he was he was breeding it for its wool and also for the meat as well, and that just uh, the, the sheep just exploded. They were uh, uh, through the United States and Canada and also um, down in uh, Tasmania and Australia okay. and New Zealand, and that's so they just spread. It 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 was they were that was the it sheep at the at the time. There's always seems to be an it sheep. Yes, there's yeah, throughout time. That's really that's a good episode. We should do the it sheep. <laughs> it sheep. Well, our it <laughs> through our the, through it the sheep ages. Today, the it sheep. Which brings us back to the it sheep today. Yeah. For this episode, the Paulworth. So what happened then? Yes, in like in the 1880s, uh, the now. Uh, the now the sons of the original brothers, you know, some of them inherited these properties. That the are the elderly, the elderly uh, brothers. Um, then they started to, they wanted to improve on this stock that they had, and so they crossbred the Saxon Merino with the Lincoln Longwell. So by that they improved the stock because the Lincoln Longwell, known for each each has its own, um, you know, best qualities. 
The long wool, obviously, because the long crimp staples are wonderful to work with, and they're more, a more rugged um, sheep for the terrain and that sort of thing. So by getting a more robust sheep with the beautiful softness of the merino, they developed they developed the Polworth. So there were sort of like three original stock breeds there, and they sort of had their own names at the time. Um, one of them was the Alexander had a daughter Mary who married. Um, who married uh, her husband took over one of the farms. Mary married. Mary, she married. <laughs> she married. She's the daughter of Alexander, and he he was you know inherited her bought her took over one of these these farms and and herds of sheep, and and he called his when they were simultaneously the different farms bred the merinos with the Lincoln, and his sheep he called them the ideals. He had a couple of names for them, but he called them the ideals because he. He thought they were the ideal sheep, and one of the other uh, one of the other farms called it. You know, brothers called it the. Uh, they were like called the com the comeback herd or the comeback sheep. But by then, twenty five years later, as they were continuing to breed and they were they you know the the breed stock was becoming more and more um, common known. The by nineteen nineteen, the uh, Australian Sheep Breeders Association decided on let's name this breed as a unique breed to Australia and this is where they called them the Paulworth sheep because the three original brothers bred in the district of Victoria the county of Paulworth and that's yep. how they were named the Paulworth sheep and that's that very similar today. to that's very similar to the naming conventions that they used in in England at the time which makes sense yeah. yes exactly and so here's some of it and this is part of the breed study that um, so it's, it's so nice to bring this out and be able to talk about it. But, you know, I'm glad that you talked about this and, and the fact that they took the Merino and the Lincoln Longwell together because this is the exact reason why I wanted this yarn. It's because of the softness, but also soft. the, I, I was talking about the shine, oh, like the sheen to it. And, and that's from the Lincoln Longwell. See, that makes sense. Yeah. So it all makes sense. Super now. exciting. Um, and, and here's the, the proof that it, that it actually worked is, and it is takes and it so takes well, and it takes so this. well to dye and then the sheen because of the sheen of the long wool you get that nice sheen in the colors as well yeah yeah I'm really happy with it it's uh, it's fantastic and the other thing you know what's interesting as well is do you know we, we mentioned I know we mentioned we always been I'm learning more and more how the merino has such an influence in a lot oh, of for sure. because with the Rambouillet yeah. as we mentioned in the past um, what was the percentage oh gosh now I forget I think it's fifty percent. Oh, I hope I'm right. I think it's 50% of the um, sheep in West in the Western U.S. have a, the bloodline of the Rambouillet, which goes back to the Merino. Wow. So that explains how the interbreeding in the of the sheep there seems to be a lot of Merino, which people seem to always want the softness in the wool. Everybody knows yeah. Merino, and then and then I like that's the right. And then too. by us talking about these different wools. I mean, if it's 75% merino, who would know that unless you did a little research? That's right. Because how could you explain how, oh, this is as super soft as, you know, Paul with Rambouillet. It's just as soft as, you know, merino, merino, merino. But they're like 75% merino in the stock breed. Yeah. So that it's genuinely super soft for that reason. Now, you've mentioned Rambouillet. I know. So that's going into our next topic. Is it? It is. Why is that? I, well, this is so when we prepare for uh, an episode, I'll just do we prepare <laughs> and, I, and well, this is where I'm getting to it. I'll put together some topics that we're going to talk about, and some of them I don't share with Jamie. Others I do share um, because That's we try to make it. I like to surprise you. So I'm going to talk about our adoption. Make me think. We've we our adoption. <laughs> what? Excuse me. Surprise. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I didn't have a baby. We are having <laughs> not one. About? We're having. We've adopted four. What are you talking about? It's under the category of collaboration. So okay. we have um, leased a fleece. <laughs> how does that work? We've leased fleeces, four of them. So this is how it works. Um, there is one of my favorite farms. Okay. Is Gainer Homestead, and it is about. I'd say it's four hours from here. So if you went down the highway, we're 15 minutes north of the big highway, and then over and head west, 
and drive for four hours. You, West. Yeah, they're, so they're this side of London. They're located in Dorchester, Ontario, uh, 60, about 65 acres, 68 acres. Wow, that's and, not too far at all. And they have some, well, not too, that's all relative, <laughs> four hour drive. <laughs> anyway. We're in Canada. Uh, it's close. Yeah, it's, it's just around the corner. Um, I, I do think on their website it does say, uh, we're your country neighbor. So, oh. so they're neighbors, basically. And so the program is this. You can lease a fleece. And what does that mean? It means that That's what I they have a number of sheep and you can um, select a sheep. And what happens is they'll feed the sheep. They'll give you updates on the sheep. And then in the springtime, um, when it's time for a haircut, you will go over and pick up your fleece. Oh. So, so do we support it in some way? Well, we bought the fleece. Oh, you purchased it in advance? You purchased it in advance. So it's yours? Yes, it's yours. Can we send them treats? <laughs> we want a better fleece. It, it actually, I, I love your questions because they, on, their, on their website it talks about the questions that you're asking. We'll send them some special, I think, some special hay. So if you were a sheep, who would you want to be fed with? A farmer who knows what they're doing or us? And so I would say... Uh, we care about the well-being of the sheep, so right. so it's uh, Brenda and Tara. They'll be the ones looking after oh, this. Will the, make the their, sheep. This will make their their fleece just shine that much more. Just get a little bit of this. So we have a. So do you want to know who we've adopted? Mm -hmm. Okay, Olive. Olive. She's six, and she's from Alberta. They're all from Alberta. Okay. And Jill. She's six. Jill. Yep. Or Jill. 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 Olive. That's Jill. my Scarborough accent. Jill. Okay. And then Sue, who's nine. Sue. Sue. And then the last one I know you'll love is Nellie, nine. <laughs> Why am I going to love Nellie? <laughs> Just to remind me of that little Nellie from Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. And so we're really excited. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to participate in this program. And then we will get updates on the sheep. And we'll share the share the updates wow. uh, with everyone. And That's then, exciting. It is exciting. And not only that, uh, we'll go and pick it up. And then we will take it to a mill and we'll have it processed in the mill. And I'm going to be, before we do that, I'm going to be asking the viewers what weight they'd be most interested in with Whoa. respect to the, to the, okay. to the wool. And then we'll get it, uh, majority will win and we will basically um, do that. We'll, we'll have it spun in, in that weight. And what would be fantastic is, you know, when we actually get the fleece or when we get down there, we could, t we need to take pictures of Nellie and Jill and, Sue Olive, and Olive and Sue, yep, and and we could have them and them on, on as the sheep on our website. The actual, you mean like up here? <laughs> it's not really real. No, but the pictures. Oh, of I there. thought you meant that. No, no, the I thought you meant the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one. Oh gosh. Yeah, no, we'll have pictures of of, of the sheep as well. Okay. Um, so that's really exciting. I'm so excited about this. It's it's fantastic. And again, they are one of my favorite farms, and they've got their fleece is amazing. It's so uh, their yarn is amazing. It's it's really nice. I'm looking nice. forward to visit a sheep farm. But I didn't close the loop. So once we get the that processed mm -hmm. at the mill in the weight that people choose, like the the majority, uh, we'll come back and we'll dye it, and then we're gonna sell it all. So. So you'll have an opportunity to, to to buy that. So I'm, I'm super excited about this collaboration. Very good. Yeah. So no, that's our adoption story. Okay. One thing, another thing I didn't put on here is that you had a birthday recently. Oh, gosh. <laughs> another one of those. They just keep coming around. I mean, it's almost like they're coming around monthly now. And so I bought Jamie something, oh, something yes. I thought was practical and something that he would need because we've got a lot of snow and ice around here. Well, yeah. So when I opened this up, I thought... I thought, oh, okay. I was like, I'll show you. And I was like, ooh, leather and chain. <laughs> oh my goodness. He what wasn't is, sure where to put them on. What is this all about? And I was like, what? I was like, it's new bling. I was like, how did these, how did these <laughs> work? Then I saw the spikes. Have you figured it out? It took me a while. I seriously thought it was some kind of you know, for one of my outfits or something or other. But it is. It's for my... It is for... It's an outfitter's outfit. Um, you attach them to your boots. Yeah. And they stretch. And when we go off into the trails, what happens is over here, when we go into the conservation area especially, it gets very packed and icy yeah. and slippery. And there's 
ditches and valleys and um, yeah so this was the reason it was very thoughtful because what happened I'll share this because at the end of our our road trip last year mm -hmm. um, on the very final day of all of our freaking hiking and traveling and up yeah we did a ton of ton of hiking and a ton of country mountain walks I slipped on the rocks they were wet near the water and so I fell really hard and hurt my back yeah so it's been a problem off and on since and it's been five months so these are to assure that I don't slip because yeah. I can't afford to slip and fall on my butt because I broke my crack <laughs> you cracked it <laughs> I did <laughs> not funny but funny funny but not funny but okay so speaking of your gear uh -huh. um, should I take out my whip sure now I, there's a little bit of explaining with this whip the in June in June in January, early January, uh -huh. I was thinking, where's the winter? It was mild. We did have some snow, but we didn't have as much snow. No, we didn't have that We didn't much. have the big snowstorms that you we normally get where you're sitting in your cabin by a fire knitting and the snow is all around. We, we didn't experience that. And so, and the, the bone chilling cold weather either. So right. call me crazy, but I, I need to have that in my winter. Not every day, but <laughs> I do like to feel that. I like to, it makes me feel alive. Well, we love the winters here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Different in the city. Yeah. Because the city gets slushy, wet, and when yeah. you have to go from point A to point B. But in the countryside, it's so beautiful when it's coming down. And we're and, not driving anywhere. And we're not going anywhere. We're not yeah. getting on the highway. So we just take walks. Did you say we're not going anywhere? No, I did not say <laughs> that, <laughs> did I? It was so frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Anywheres. Anyway. Same difference. Anyways. That's another so, one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, so that just shortly after I said I was thinking that, I got out of bed, walked downstairs, and I could feel the cold. I thought you had the front door open. And I could feel the cold weather just blowing in through the front door. And I thought, I have to do something about this. And yes. so I thought, I'm going to knit something for the front door. Yes. And we've had a couple of blizzards since. Well, fairly fair size. We've got a lot of snow out there now. So we've gone snowshoeing a couple of times. And there's quite a bit of snow. And we've been in a couple of cold spells. We're in another cold spell now. Yep. So I went to a go-to book, <laughs> which we talked about. Do you recognize these guys? No. No. Who are they? <laughs> Who are those two? Arna and Carlos. <laughs> did you say it correctly? I did. Yes. Okay. So anyway, I remember seeing this in the book. And, um, and, what, and what is that? This is a the sausage roll. draft... It's a sausage roll. It's a draft stopper. Oh, so it's called exactly what it is. It, I thought there would be some, stops you know, like, some, well, you know funny thing? some scientific knit, you know, lo lingo name. I can never remember the name of this. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. It's a draft stopper. It stops the draft. The draft. What is that yeah. thing called? It stops the draft. You know that thing? I don't know why. I can never remember the name of it. So anyway, it's sounding a little too much like me. You know, that thing. <laughs> it stops the drafts. Okay, so, so I thought it? to myself, self, you need to do something about this. And That's pretty amazing. Um, you need to get going on this. So oh my gosh. I dropped my all my projects and started to focus on this. And I'm almost, I'm more than halfway, for sure. Yeah. Because this is the halfway point. So this is a really interesting pattern because what you do is you measure the uh, distance of the door and this is a set size it's a good starting point yes it's a good starting point and then so this is the this is fixed so basically um you knit you follow the pattern you knit up to here and this is where you can make it as long as you want because this is oh so you take this i see so you have this pattern on one end so can you so you ready to do your math so you take the measurement of the door then you take the measurement of this, multiply it by two, and subtract the distance of the, the, the distance of the door, and that will give you this length. So it's it's really fun to knit. <laughs> you look. Like... I just wing it. It's like okay, this is this long. I, I would measure that and say how long is it, how wide is the door? Okay, double this. What's the distance in between? Measure it. No math to be done. Just measure it. There it is. So it's it's a lot of fun to knit. <laughs> so this is almost just in thirds. This I want to show you a mistake this is though, that I did. Practically in thirds. I want to show you a, a mistake I did because I think, but I've I oh, normally. Oh, it's ruined. Does that mean it's not going to stop the draft? <laughs> no, normally because I think it's it's a, it's a good lesson. So it's not going to stop the draft. Normally, 
ruined. It's ruined. The, the, the breeze is going to go right through. The cold air is going to go right through. There's going to oh, be icicles on it in the morning. But so if you look at this section and you can see that it's um, the dominant color is, is gold. So when I was watching one of our TV shows, I wasn't paying attention and I switched hands. So what I'm doing is you I'm... switched hands. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I switched the yarn in the hands. So this is what I did. Um, so That's this is color stranded knitting and I've got a knitting. I'm holding my needles and my yarn and I am continental knitting on my left hand and throwing on my right hand so that I'm... Um, and sometimes knitting. you throw on your left hand. <laughs> so what happened was, and so if you want the dominant color, the dominant color should be on your left hand when you're doing color strand knitting, uh, two colors. And so I reversed them for a row and that's why I've and got this happened. line, this line right here. This is, so the brown is, is dominant. Oh, just there? Yeah. Oh gosh. Anyway. I hope that I hope any <laughs> guests that might show up unexpectedly at our door don't notice the, that the, um, what is it called again? <laughs> The draft, the draft stopper, stopper has a little bit of a, a prominent brown spot. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so the next thing was what yarn am I going to use? Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm not going to buy any yarn right now because we the, have yarn. We so have, the yeah, options are really stash. to go stash. go to the stash or um, do some knit, um, dye some of my own. But then I thought, you know what, I've, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to our stash and look and see what I can get. And I will talk about my ideal yarn for this and then the stuff that I found for me because it was kind of a mismatch of things but what you look for when you're making this is you don't want a soft yarn that's going to pill because this is going to be on the floor and people might step on it and and whatnot so you need to look for a, um, a durable yarn right. so I'll talk about the yarn that I used and then I'll talk about the ideal yarn if I were to go out and buy well when it. you think about it I mean Ideal yarn. I mean, you're throwing the thing on the floor. And but I'm gonna, you use beautiful yarn. No, no, and, and, and that's beautiful. not what. Yeah, but beautiful. So ideal yarn is the a yarn that's perfect for yes, the project. So exactly. something that's not going to pill and something that's durable, durable and sturdy. Stronger. And I've got two great suggestions for you. Which but, are? Well, I'm going to save that until I talk about this first. Yeah. So what I found was, I'm not sure. I found um, this is natural dyed yarn, and this is was from. Carrie Westlake. Oh yes, Carrie. Mm -hmm. And she used um, goldenrod in this. And remember, she, it's, it said that she used uh, Brazil wood as well, which I don't see in here. But maybe this... it was light, light in it. Okay. Well, maybe if there's a slight oranginess to it, but I don't see it. But it's a got it's kind of a mustard color. I'm not sure. How yeah, it's, coming it's a really nice mustard. It's beautiful. This is from Red. Topsy Farms. Red, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, this is blue. This is blue. Now this is indigo. We this is something that I dyed. It's indigo. This is um, and That's I, nice. yeah. It's I I don't know. This is kind of a crunchy yarn. Crunchy. I don't think that's what it is. It is. It is. Oh, can I wear that around my sorry, neck? Sorry, it's rustic. It's rustic, but it's, it's not rustic. not something you'd want to wear on your on your body necessarily. No, I, I would wear socks or mitts with that. And then this one, I normally wouldn't use I would wear it. um for this project it's because it's really soft. Oh that's beautiful. What is that? Or is well, it just a remnant? It was is I needed brown. Well, and so it just and I'm running was out it of just it. a remnant? Yeah so it's um yeah so I'm running out of brown so I'll probably mix the black in because yeah. Uh, so I, I, I mean, mean it's already I mean it's beautiful. It's really gorgeous. I mean that would make a great sweater. It's obviously not blocked. <laughs> but it would make a great sweater, though, is what it would be. But it's funny how there's so well, much work going into we something. We talked about that in another episode. But there's so much work and, and so much detail that it's did gorgeous. Did we not talk about the sweater in an earlier episode? Yes, we did. <laughs> it's so gorgeous that, you know, for something that you're going to use, that's actually a useful sort of, what do you call that? Like it's a, oh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's kind of good. Is it a, a, a draft stopper? Yes. As opposed to something you're going to wear, it's just a function, a yes. functional piece that you're throwing on the floor. It's actually quite beautiful. Sure, but it's all part of your house. You want your house this to look is beautiful. True. So this anyway, is true. If, if I were to go out and buy, there are two, two options for me on mm -hmm. this one. One of them would be to go to Topsy Farms and buy their yarn. Uh, because the air, I'd probably buy the Aran weight. They have Aran worsted and I think fingering. But Aran weight would probably be the best. And the colors... 
that they have for sale are just just exactly like the pattern so oh, it's great and the best thing about okay. it is this is the exact type of yarn that you'd want to use on this project because it's nice and it's really sturdy it's fantastic and it's nine dollars which is that's really, really nine dollars canadian so that's like seven dollars and sixty cents that's american like free american yeah it's pretty much free <laughs> but it's so it's really good i would definitely don't pick quote this. me on that though and the other one i would pick is briggs and little um atlantic they would um not Icelandic. I Atlantic. And <laughs> there's no tick in Icelandic. <laughs> so it would Never be Never mind. <laughs> no, the last <laughs> we were talking about Icelandic. Um Oh my gosh. I kept saying it sounded like it sounded Icelandic. Like, because of the way you were speaking quickly and it sounded like Icelandic. Yes. Someone mentioned it as, you know, we know the sheep and I was saying Icelandic. <laughs> it's Icelandic. And for some reason with with the microphone, it sounded like you kept saying Iceland tick, Iceland tick. So this is um, Atlantic by Briggs and Little, and they've got all the colors in the universe. Um, so that would be another one. And Briggs and Little are sold everywhere. They're yeah. sold all over North America um, and probably in Europe as well. So I, those are two options, and the price points on those are very reasonable as well. So yes. I would either pick Topsy Farms, um, which is just right down the road. And I want to mention we love Topsy Farm yes. because those people, we've met them, they are wonderful, wonderful people. They run a very, they are a very work, hard working and humble group. There is a whole history there that's amazing. If you want to check out the website, there's a story there. And uh, yeah, they're great people. And Briggs and Little, we were supposed to make it to the East Coast. We yeah. were supposed to last yeah. year, that didn't happen. But we're coming to see you. Absolutely. And you'll be are. our next favorite special people, I'm <laughs> sure. So that's my whip for, for this. And the next the next episode that we have, this will be finished. And if I can tear it away from the front door, then I will um, show you the front door. It'll be cold in to, here. I have to fill it as well. It'll be cold in here during that episode because he's going to take it that's away right. from that. That's right. No, yeah. we'll ask Zan to sit by the front door. He usually does. He loves sitting by the front door. That's because sometimes he likes to cool off because he's looking like a sheep these days. Yeah. And he, he, yeah, he lay down at the front door because he likes to cool off a little bit there. Yeah, so I'll stuff this. He'll have a pillow now. I'll steam it, stuff it, and then bring it back to show you. Okay. So now where are we at? We are at, um, we had your birthday. It's coming up yeah. to Valentine's. It is Valentine's Day. It's coming up. And I wanted to honor Valentine with one of these. Now, do you remember what this is from? I do. So you've do got you? your heart on. Yeah. And how come you don't have your heart on? Where is it? I'm sitting on it. <laughs> I saw it. You. I saw it upstairs somewhere, and then I thought I knew it was going to be misplaced, and I can't. I couldn't find the other. I've misplaced heart. my heart. Yeah. So misplaced. So Valentine's Day. What are we going to talk about Valentine's Day? Just, I was meant to have a whip. And <laughs> oh, I remember my whip. Yes, I do. Because did. we found this pattern and it was hearts and a hat. And it was a very, he thought the simple pattern would be great for me. And um, I didn't get it started. No. But I had another little project on the go. But we could talk about it. Do you want to talk about a little history of Valentine? Well, I know you do. But do you, have, do you have something else to share? <laughs> no, about I don't. Time? You don't have a heart. And the answer is he yes. He doesn't have a heart. I don't have, I a, heart. have a heart. My heart on is not And I have on. a history. Yeah. So the history of Valentine. Well, okay. I'm going to try to make this one brief. As brief as possible. Because when it comes to St. Valentine, there are, you know, in, in, oh my gosh, in Christian, in the Christian science or religion, there's probably about a dozen or so. Um, but I'm going to mention three that go way back. So let's go back to um, Roman times. So one of the Valentines during Roman times apparently was Valentine, a priest. And he was um, known to help some of the Christian prisoners escape from the brutal Roman jails. He was finally discovered and lo and behold, the emperor at the time, Claudius II, had him beheaded. Wow. And that's one of the St. Valentines. Now, there is another Valentine around the same time, a priest, who Claudius II, it was his belief that 
single men made the best soldiers. So he banned um, marriage. So Valentine was completely against this. The priest didn't believe it for a minute. So he continued to provide uh, the marriage ceremony secretly. And once he was discovered, he got the chop. Though that's two of the St. Valentines. And there's a legend as part of that story. One so, so, so we have two guys who've had their head chopped off named St. Valentine. Well, they weren't saints. They were Valentine. Oh, well, they were Valentine's. They became the saint, I suppose. <laughs> so that's... the trick is don't name your kid Valentine. <laughs> that's right. Our Valentina. Or Valentina. I had, there was, there a, was Valentina. a Valentina. Well, there was a Valentina in one of my classes in high school. Oh. And there's a Valentina. There was, I did come across a Valentina who, it's not only, uh, there were not only, you know, m men who were Valentine, St. Valentine. There was a Valentina. I briefly, I was going to take note of it, but I, I, but I didn't. But there was a Valentina and she was St. Valentina. Did but you the other, head chopped off? I, d I didn't, I didn't, oh. yeah, I didn't compute that history. We'll have to, we'll have to check that I'll out. I'll have to check her out again. Odds are she did. But there was another, so there's another legend with, the Valentine around the same time in the Roman times that one of these Valentine priests who was imprisoned before his death fell in love with the um, jail guard's daughter and before his death he sent her a love letter and it was signed from your Valentine and that's where that started. Now by the fifth century there was a Pope um, Gelatius like gelato, but he was gelatious, the first. <laughs> that's a, that's an even tastier gelato, gelatious. Gelatious. <laughs> <laughs> he was a real pope, and he named, he declared February the 14th as St. Valentine's Day. And that's because the earlier priests who were, you know, martyrs, became saints, were either uh, killed or buried around mid during the Ides of February, which we know as the Ides of March in Roman times is mid-February, so February 14th. And so a little later in, um, let's say, medieval times when France, was it medieval times where France and England, they started to believe in, in the romance of Valentine's Day because it would be around springtime where they imagine uh, the birds you know, everything's in bloom, the birds are calling out singing and mating, and then that's where, because they're calling and looking for their mate, oh. their loved one, their mate, and matching. And in a poem by famous poet uh, Chaucer, yeah. um, he mentions, he has a line that mentions, um, on this day of Valentine's, on St. Valentine, our, is when our fowl, will choose its mate in one of the poems. And that's the beginning of love and mates and finding your sure. perfect match. I also want to mention a couple of Valentine's Day rituals around the world. Was there a St. Hallmark? <laughs> Is Hallmark all because that's where the greeting cards came? Well, let me tell you, before okay, before I get into these traditions, that's a good point because the original Valentine, so we have the Chaucer poem, but there there is a written Valentine, which is supposed to be one of the very first Valentines. It's in the London Library oh. in London, England, and is dated from 1415, and it was some famous duke who wrote a love letter, a Valentine to his wife who was imprisoned in the Tower of London. And it is said to be the official first oh. ever Valentine. Excellent. So that goes, yeah, 1415. So there you have the Valentine moved into a Valentine greeting card. So yep. traditions around the world. I'm going to mention, oh, what's the first one I want to mention? Let's mention Wales. So in Wales, the men would carve wooden spoons that they would then give to their potential love interest. Now they carved the spoon quite intricately with hearts and some of them even had uh, uh, a, numbered, a number of beads or notches in the spoon and that was to symbolize how many children they would hope to have with their potential oh. mate in the spoon. 
Yes. So this was pre-marriage or? Yeah, they're say? looking for their, 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 you know, we give a valentine, they give a spoon. Because I was just thinking. They gave a spoon a... with a hint, hint, I'd like five children. Or <laughs> hint, hint, notch, notch, notch. I'd like 11 children, just so you know. She, yeah. Well, she was cousin, probably not. My cousin Peter, he lives in Wales. But I think he was married before he went to Wales, so he because oh. he was from he's from Leicester. So you don't think he carved a spoon? I don't think he I, th I don't think he carved a spoon. He probably gave a, a I'll have to ask him if he gave a card or a spoon. Okay, so let's mention another tradition. Let's sure. go to let's go to Slovenia. In Slovenia, that goes back to the mating of the birds. So it's tradition for. All the single ladies, you know, the bird, it's, this is again, because they, they, sometimes there's early spring around that time in some of these, these areas. So now it's early spring, flowers are in bloom, birds are out calling, singing for their mates, looking for their mates. Now all the single ladies, you, the, the tradition is you step outside your door and you look up into the skies and the first bird that you spot, that's the bird that's going to tell you something about your future husband based on the first bird that you see wow. what that husband's going to be like or all about that's that tradition so like an albatross or <laughs> oh i don't know that's <laughs> up for interpretation i don't know what does that bird mean or what did you see? a cuckoo bird <laughs> a cuckoo bird what about a dodo bird <laughs> that means you're never getting married because they don't exist <laughs> anymore <laughs> That's not how it works. I don't know. I don't know the interpretation of how wow. how you interpret that bird's going to be like your husband. I hope he's not, you know, just doing a lot of clucking. That wouldn't be good. What about Big Bird? <laughs> hey, who doesn't want a big man? I don't know. Leave it up to those Slovenian single ladies to decide. Okay, and you... <laughs> okay, let's talk about when in France. This one's fun. Yes. And we have, we have some more relatives in France, so we're gonna, I'm going to do a fact check on this one. Yes. Okay, so in France, what they would do, now what they would do in France was, um, single, the single people on the street would come out, onto, out, of their house, out of their homes and call one another across the street to their neighbors across the way. And the men would call out the names, or they'd call out names and try to match and pair up um, these single ladies and single men, they would pair them up. And a man, if he, he, was, he was matched with a woman, but if he, he thought that she wasn't really a good match, she, he'd send her on her way and her name could be called out again and be matched with another man. So, okay, so hold on a second here. That sounds rude. So, so did, does a woman have any say in this? I or don't is it know, just but the I just mentioned, I just read the details how, how the names are called out, but it sounded like the men were it calling out the names. It had to be first and last. But I, don't, I didn't know if the men called out, like if I was to call out like, oh, Suzette, Christopher, that way, you know, Suzette, oh. Lisette, Annette, Crip Paulette. Suzette. I'd say yes to Crepe Suzette. <laughs> Paulette, Annette, Suzette, <laughs> Colette, Christopher. Or if, if you would call out to the one you would maybe think you wanted to meet with. I'm not sure. And what happens if they didn't want that? Well, this is the thing. This tradition, what would happen is eventually at the end of when all the name, the, you know, the calling out of the name stopped, there was undoubtedly some single ladies who were not matched in the end. So tradition had it that these single ladies would get together, they'd start a bonfire, and they'd gather the pictures, pictures and belongings of some of these men who rejected them, and they would throw them and burn them in the fire. Oh, it wasn't their the, wallet. The men who Jeez. rejected them <laughs> burned it in the fire. And, that, and wow. that, eventually, that eventually was banned by the French government. I'm thinking because of these bonfires <laughs> happening on the streets. And on the other hand, okay, but on the opposite side of things, in, in the Philippines, as some of you may know this tradition because you see it on the news year upon year, is they have government-sanctioned and sponsored mass weddings on Valentine's Day. Oh, wow. And they, they so much as even provide the rings for the couples. So Jeez. it's very popular because some of these couples could have what they would think is the dream wedding. Yeah. Um, and all sponsored and, uh, yeah, oh, wow. by the government and sanctioned Jeez. and sponsored. And it was, it's still a very popular thing. Hmm. And there's one more little tradition that I wanted to mention. It's a German tradition, but it's a surprise. So I'm going to be back momentarily. Okay, so what I'm doing today, Christopher's not aware of. I'm making something special as part of Valentine's Day German tradition. It's going to be a... Uh, 
heart cookie that's traditional to give to someone on Valentine's Day. So it's basically a gingerbread recipe, which we don't really need to go over because someone else has done gingerbread before, but here we go. Anyway, I've already got my butter and my sugar in the bowl. I'm gonna blend that, smooth that out. Then I'm gonna add some eggs, some molasses, flour, cinnamon, and the ginger. Mix it all together, and we're gonna have a dough, hopefully. Now, I'm gonna take some parchment paper, I'm gonna roll this dough out, and go from there. Hearts and they're going in the oven. You think Jamie's coming back? He's been gone for a while. What do you think? Hmm? Oh, look what I see. Oh, look what I see. What's that? Sad. Oh. Did he squeeze in? <laughs> Barely. Okay, so here we have a German tradition. As I mentioned, the German cookie on Valentine's Day. <laughs> so, <laughs> little buggy, she tried to. Oh my goodness. Okay, so. What does it say? Well, this one's for you. Ich liebe dich. Does it fit my fat head? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you gotta wear it around your neck. Okay. Don't break that cookie. I won't. Oh, and the little dog. No, I'll hold it back here. Okay, okay. the little dog come over here. Yep. Yeah. Uh, come here, Sam. Look at... Oh my goodness, Sam. <gasps> What's this? What the fuck are you saying? Come here. <laughs> come here. Oh my goodness, Sam. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this isn't gonna work. Come here, you... Oh my oh, goodness. Oh, the back. They're, they're, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so, and this one says, come here, little bee. Oh, my little dog. <laughs> and this one says, Bakken, which is <laughs> little bear. <laughs> and ich, ich liebe dich. Ich liebe dich. <laughs> which is, I love biscuit. No, it's not. And that's the German tradition of the Valentine's Day cookie tradition. What, you get your dog on the table or whatever, and cookie runs? <laughs> <laughs> well, it smells great. It smells great and it looks great. So what did you say mine says? Ich liebe dich. And what does that mean? Figure it out. What do they say <laughs> on Valentine's Day? Can we see it? <laughs> I say I love cookies. I didn't get a valentine. Maybe someone will You're send You're wearing me. yours. Well, I am. I'm wearing it on my heart. Maybe <laughs> someone will send me a valentine from afar. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hint. <laughs> well, happy okay. Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. And thank you very much. Okay, then. I think it's on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Now, what are we talking about next? We are doing the giveaway. Oh, of course, the giveaway. Yeah. How are we going to do that? Oh, yeah, we, we are going to, it. it's very easy, it's very simple. We are going okay. to put our hands in here, pull them out, and we've got three winners. And oh, so, yes, because you mentioned we were going to have three pots, right? Yeah. With three different winners for, because there were three. Three questions. Original questions. Yeah. So which one are we starting with? Well, before we start, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating. We had, um, a huge number of people participate and there were I would say 95% of you got all the questions right 
Yeah, and and the thing was, well, most got, and even if you just got at least one right, you you got to enter your name in one of the pots. Cause That's correct. Yeah, three questions. If you got them, all, if you got all three of them right, your name is in each of the pots. Right. So yeah. some people might have answered one incorrectly, yeah. but that was rare. That was very rare. Very rare. So, but their names, yeah. their names would be in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. So which one are you starting with? Okay, we're going to start with Jamie's pot. That's the one. Does and that do you remember what start? the question? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Do you remember what the question was? <laughs> no. Oh, then, yes, I how do. Could you, you couldn't even answer your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do remember because it was like. Oh, and hold on. Before you do that. What? So, well, I just want to show again what this looks like. So it's the pattern for the tennis gray retro. Oh, yes, um, of course. Modern cowl. Oh, that's, yes, of yeah. course. The, yeah. yes, that's the pattern that you yeah. want to win. Okay, yes. I remember my question because name How's something that it's a mess. <laughs> um, it's named something that Jamie made in his kitchen. Yes. I made stuff. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can see, I really can. It's the light. Okay, so the winner is Sandra Soliano. <laughs> yep. Sandra Soliano. Jamie. That's me. <laughs> No, so That's I made sure right I put question. them in the right pots. Yes. So okay. what we will do is we will put the, uh, just send me, I'll put my email in the show notes and then send me an email and I will hook you up with a pattern. Okay. So this was the pot for your question. Okay. Do you remember your question? Mm, I think I do. What it was, was it? what, in, in my instructional videos, uh, oh, yes. videos, the episodes, what did I use? As, what did I use to dye yarn with? Okay. He used lots of stuff. I used lots of stuff. Am I, <laughs> you can pretty I, much... Could, I'm too late. Am I too late to... You're too late to enter. Okay. Do you need your glasses? Ron Flannery. Ron Flannery. Ron Flannery, congratulations. Gets a pattern. He gets a pattern. The Tannis Gray pattern. Yep. The Tannis Gray. Excellent. Grape. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, and speaking of Tannis, this is Tannis's It is draw yes. pot. Yep. So I think you're gonna do the honors. Am I doing this one? Yeah. Oh gosh, okay, let me oh gosh. Okay, let me get my glasses. I'm gonna spray oh. these around a bit. <laughs> well, do you remember the questions? No. Well we have to before you say the name, we have to say the questions. So the questions were um, <laughs> does she have, uh, does Tannis have more than 550 patterns? The answer is yes. More than 550 Yes. Patterns? Yep. And does she um, regularly uh, appear on a um, PBS show? Uh, the answer is yes to that. And then the last one, does she live in um, Montreal? And the answer is no. That was kind of a trick question because there is a very popular Canadian uh, indie dyer oh, Tannis who that lives in trick. Montreal. So that was that it was, was almost a trick. like a three part question, but not really. It was like A, B, or C. So the question is, where does Tannis Gray live? And she lives in Fairfax, Virginia. Not and Montreal. a lot of you knew that. So not Montreal because that's the other Tannis. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was the challenging, the more challenging question. <laughs> yes, it some, was. I would think. Yeah. But we do have someone. Oh, maybe it's someone from Montreal, or oh. maybe it's someone. Well, maybe. The name seems rather French. So, it's Natalie or Nathalie Lamoureux. How many times I've been in it, it's got Lamoureux in it. Lamoureux. Oh, geez. I, did, That's funny. I know the anglicization Lamour. sometimes forbid if I say it incorrectly, but there are, yes. being from Northern Ontario, I mean, I have cousins in my last name. They've anglicized the name. They, they don't even pronounce it as a French name. They've changed it completely to it. And we knew some Lamoureux, but it's Lamoureux. Nathalie Natalie Lamoureux. Congratulations. And, and also just a, a, a shout out to Tannis Gray again for providing the um, three patterns. Uh, yeah, that's, that's super that's nice wonderful. of you to do. So thank you so much. And thanks everyone for participating in that as well. I did want to talk about one more thing. You did? Yeah. And that is um, interviews okay. for 2021. Okay, yeah, because we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah, we were planning on doing some interviews in 2020. However, because of COVID, we just didn't do them. But I think we're not. That's not going to let us stop. That's not going to stop us for 2021. So we are going to do some, and we've lined up. Um, we've got two 
that we've lined up so far. Are we going to, are we sharing that? Well, or keeping it as a surprise? No, I'm not very good with secrets, so I'm going to share, I'm going to share, well, it share one them of all from me. <laughs> I'm always the last to know. No, I'm so, really, because I'm really super excited about um, the, the ones that we do have. And the criteria was really, you know, when we were thinking about who do we want to interview, um, always, you know, farmers, I'm always interested in farmers who are doing great things w with respect to their sheep um, and having a sustain sustainable farming and whatnot. Um, so that's that's always an attraction. And especially if you, they've got um, sheep that we're really interested in as okay. well. And then I, I love um, you know, talking to really dynamic people in the in the knitting and crochet world uh, or the fleece world. And so I will tell you before Christmas, it was just a couple, maybe it was a week before Christmas or a couple weeks yeah. before Christmas, I received an email from somebody that I adore. I think she is fantastic. Uh, and she, I got this completely out of the blue and I've never met her. Uh, but we've exchanged emails and whatnot, and I've read a number of her books. She's published, I think, um, probably around 20 books. Oh. And so okay. it's Sylvia Olson out of, uh, and, and lives in British Columbia. And she's just a phenomenal, I'm, I'm so excited. She's just a phenomenal uh, writer, but she's just, her influence and the knowledge that she shares uh, with this craft is just amazing. So I'm so excited. I So, Today I forgot. I'm so excited. I've even forgot where to. So I got I got a manuscript from yes. her a, in an email, and she asked me to read it before it goes to publication, and so um, and to give my comments, any comments. And that was a treat because oh one of the gosh. surprises was the fast. What I loved was the fascinating history along with everything else yes. she was talking about in the book. Yeah. That was. Well, I love that part of it myself. Yeah. But you were you were astonished by it and the, and the knowledge and the wealth of information in there. I learned a lot in this I book. Was, yeah. And, and and I guess if you think of Clara Parks, um, who wrote Van, um, Nitlandia and uh, Vanishing Fleece, she's I would say that there's some similarities there. Uh, okay. But Sylvia brings an indigenous lens to 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 the story, and it is fascinating. If you love road trips, if you want to know more about Canada. Um, it's a great, it's a fantastic book. So I was so excited about and it's, that. It's, it's coming out soon, is it? It's coming out in April. So I've asked Sylvia That's if great. she would be on the show. And so, and she said yes. So we're going to interview Sylvia, which So it's very exciting fantastic. because it's not something we've done before. And to start it off, we have a super special, that super special yes. guest. So well, we great. have done some, we've done two interviews before, but we haven't have done we? any Zoom ones. Yeah, we I? did. <laughs> you were there filming <laughs> Of course I was. <laughs> I was behind the camera. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. And the other one is, we mentioned it earlier. Um, so let me go back to... We did? Yeah. All of Jill, Sue, and Nellie. So which one? There's going to be a lot of... Is it Jill or is all, it Sue? No. Well, Nellie's the, the loudest one. But um, so, <laughs> no, it's going to be um, uh, Brandon and Tara are going to uh, oh. are, have agreed to be interviewed. Oh. So. We get to talk to them about the carrying of the sheep and their great uh, farm, and and they are. It'll be really interesting to oh, we've not hear how them. they farm and as we've well. We've not met them before. Correct? Yes, we have. Oh well, I was going to say, <laughs> do we meet them at Woodstock? <laughs> we even we were when we were vending, we were beside them. Well, that's the couple yes. I'm thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah right behind us. Yes, yes. Well, that's not funny. I said Woodstock. I know exactly who you meant. <laughs> they're right there. We yeah, were they're behind, right, right beside yes, us. Yes, for two us. years at Woodstock, right and there. then. Um, we were at another festival vending, and they were, we're right sitting, beside when us. When we were sitting at the booth, I could I could squeeze their fleece or like this. Yeah, they're awesome. And I bought honey from them. You did, yes. See, he's testing me again. I know who they are. <laughs> Lovely. And they're, yes. they're, they're yarn. And they had so great they, yarn. Yeah, they did, absolutely. And they're delicious honey. Yeah, the honey's amazing, too. So I'm really excited about I that. I had other things. I would also love to hear from you. And who would you like us to interview? Because um, we're not shy. We'll go up to anyone and and talk to them. So I'm really interested in finding out from you uh, who you think would be good f as an interviewee on this show. Yeah. So that, that would be great. Any, anybody of interest. interest? Anybody of interest. Interesting, fascinating. Yeah. Unusual. Um, yes. Yeah. I think uh, that's what we From want. any part of the world. That sounds like yeah. it. That just to me sounds like there's so many, so many artisans out there, fiber, yeah. fiber folk, that there, there, there's a, a whole lot of people that um, we should really get to know. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got a couple on our list as well. Those are the ones I'm not going to share yet um, because we want to 
Uh, we haven't reached out to them yet, so we don't know. But there's uh, it follows the same saying, theme anyway. But they may just think I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone again for all of your comments. They're fantastic. I love answering your your. I love reading them and answering them. And all the subscribers and the new subscribers as well. Yes. Welcome to Cabin Boy Nets. And I just absolutely I that the the new subscribers. It's still shocking to me that you know this big open whole wide world where we just all come together right here, just here together with us. And they could be from far and wide. I, I can't even believe it because you mentioned today. Where did you mention today? Israel. There was a comment from yeah, which was you know when we hear an unusual place. Um, well, Israel's not unusual, it's just far away. It's not unusual, but I'm thinking, well, have you been to Israel? Not lately. No. So that's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's like, oh, Israel. It's like, oh, that was a new one. That was that yes. came our way, yes. way of the commentary. So it's, yeah. it's not the unusual. It's just the usual ones would be, okay, I got one from, you know, Toronto. Yeah. Or I get one from, but I'm saying out there. Or Tasmania. Tasmania, because yes. I have a very good... One of my very good friends is in Tasmania, which I mentioned today because we talked about the Tasmanian um, origins of the Paul yes. sheep. I'm like, we could go there for the sheep, but also see one of my best buddies who moved back home to Tasmania. And we have a number of viewers from Tasmania as well. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I just, again, thank you so much for your comments and thank you for watching and have a fantastic week. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye-bye.